Um, do you remember much about where you were in 1974 in terms of coming to Hollywood? And from Is 1974 when we made it? Yeah. Well, then I was living with Jenny Salt, who and in a house on Nicholas Beach, uh, which was just south north of Malibu, that became a kind of center for a lot of uh, broke filmmakers, and. Um, I don't remember how I got the part in Black Christmas, but obviously was summoned to Toronto to do it by an agent. That's all I remember. And you, uh, and you just done Sisters before that? I'd done Sisters a couple of years before that. Um, I'd done quite a few horror movies. I did another one called, I think I was what they call a Scream Queen, Reincarnation of Peter Proud. I'd done, oh, a lot of them. And when you did horror movies, you just sort of thought nobody would see them. And in fact, here I am 20 or 30 years later or whatever, and those are the ones everyone remembers. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. So you, had you wanted to be an actor but just couldn't find any roles in Canada, and that's why you ended up moving to Los Angeles? Well, in those days, there, wasn't, you, there was a, a very limited uh, height to which you could soar. Um, and then the ceiling hit you on the head. So if you had any ambition at all, you packed up and came to L.A. or went to New York, one or the other. There was CBC and some National Film Board stuff, but very limited. And in those days, also in Canada, we're talking about the 60s, it was just not considered all right to be baldly ambitious, and it was not considered all right to be overexposed. So once you'd done four or five leads, it wasn't your turn anymore. It was a very Canadian attitude. It had to be fair, and somebody else had to have their turn. So I left in, I left a couple of times. I did, made my first movie down here when I was 18, going on 19, almost 19, with Norman Jewison. And then uh, what happened after that? I didn't like it here, so I went back to Toronto and was very much in love with the man there. And then um, made my second movie when I was 20, going on 21. I had my 21st birthday on the set of Quacks Report and There's a Cousin in the Bronx with Dean Wilder in Ireland. And then I quit acting. I had enough. I didn't like having to worry about my weight all the time. So I moved back to Vancouver and I learned film editing with Bob Altman, who was cutting Brewster McLeod and filming McCabe and Mrs. Miller. And then I ran out of money and came back to L.A. in the early 70s and did a series called Nichols. And then I just worked pretty much nonstop, uh, one movie after the other. But those days were very heady because everybody was being an experimental filmmaker and trying new things and it was the dawn of a, of a new age for movies. And, and so because we were all uh, thought we were being rather pretentiously young intellectuals who were going to change the system, doing something like B Black Christmas was a horror movie, you know, even though that's what we lived on and made our money from. So it wasn't something that when, I, even though it was great fun to make, that I thought would last this long. Nothing's astonished me more. It's a huge underground classic. It's just wild. Yeah. Was it the first film that you moved to, moved to Los Angeles? Was the first one you made in Canada and then after you sort of... Really no, I made another one in a Canadian movie called... I made a couple of others. One called A Quiet Day in Belfast, in which I played twins. One was brought up in Canada and one was Irish. It, it was the beginning of the Canadian film industry. It was just starting. And they'd gotten the idea that you could give tax credits. And in those days, I think you got a tax re a write off for investing if something and if it was a failure you got to write off the failure and the, it was just it was canada floundering around trying to find its own film industry i think that those were the days when uh, i don't know if it was telefilm or what it might have been telefilm was it telefilm yes cftc set it up and and there was this shock i remember the first or second year that the only movies making money were Quebec porno films, and there's this extraordinary debate in the Parliament about, oh dear, this isn't quite what we intended by when we offered to help the film industry out. It was a, it was, um, it was like everywhere in the early '70s. There were, there was no ceilings. Everybody was flying. No, uh, a Black Christmas was very professionally done. We had a great time, though. As young people, we were a lot looser than you guys are. You know, you're all very conservative and, and, and afraid to make mistakes. In the 70s, in the late 60s, the whole idea was to get wildly out of control and see how far you could go before you crashed. <laughs> so, so um, no, it was very professional.
what, what kind of story do you remember then from, uh, from the set? Like a lot of shrieking, a lot of changing the script on the spot and who could be the most outrageous. I, I don't have too many specifics except that Andrea Martin was so funny and made me laugh even then. Um, you know, when you're kids, <laughs> see, <laughs> when you're kids you don't have a sense. Uh, you don't quite get that there's a possibility that everybody will end up doing well in this little group and, and that um, what you're doing will be safe for posterity. I think if you had a sense of that when you were young, you'd be crippled. Your character spends uh, most of the time, uh, it's kind of comic relief in a way. Mm -hmm. It's also drunk a lot of time. Yeah. I think Bob mentioned maybe there was a bit of that going on on set too. Yes, there was a lot of partying and drinking, not on the set, but certainly after work. Yeah. Did he give you any directions you recall about your character? I think he said it was one of his creations, your character, to, uh, to have that kind of character. I don't remember. I remember um, I was attracted to her because she was wild and out of control and um, not the conventional leading lady, which was always the boring part. If you got stuck with that part, it was always really dull. Um, uh, what directions did he give me? I think he, he let me loose. I think that was primarily what he let me do. What do you remember about the other actors uh, on the set? Was I, remember, uh, I remember Olivia Hussey being very serious and earnest and trying to make her laugh. Um, and I don't think I always succeeded. Um, she, she, ha she was a star then. We weren't, Andrea and I weren't stars. Olivia was a big star. I think she'd done, had she done Romeo and Juliet yet? And everyone knew who Olivia Hussey was and she was exquisitely beautiful. Um, and I suppose Andrea and I probably weren't sympathetic enough to the realities of the pressures of stardom that she was going through at a very young age. Uh, so we were the two goofballs, and we played off each other a lot, and uh, we were definitely the comic relief after the camera stopped rolling as well as on camera. I think it was a little competition. <laughs> Who can make people laugh the most between Andrea and I? Which I expect would be picked up again today if we ever worked again. Did you know her before the movie? No, I think I met Andrea on the movie. It was a small uh, pool of talent in those days, so at a certain point, everybody knew everybody. And I, did I meet her on the set or before? I'm not sure, but I think I met her on the set, yeah. One of the scenes that, that you play, which is the most famous one, is when you're actually murdered in the film. Right, with a glass, with a glass unicorn. unicorn. Stabbed to death by a glass unicorn. I had never figured out when we were shooting it ha quite what was happening. You know, the ending of these uh, horror movies can always be a little confusing, and I had no idea till I saw the movie what had happened. I knew there was a scene in which I was wrapped and stuff and blood and all that, and we were laughing so hard when we were shooting it. Do you remember much about, did, you, did he give you freedom in terms of improvising dialogue also? Yes, I do remember that, and I can't remember Although the famous sort of spell fellatio scene was, that was all written by Bob. But I do remember, um, wait a minute. I remember Bob having to shut me up, uh, to pull, rein me in, to have me stop improvising. That also has not changed in my life. You mentioned that fellatio scene. Were you surprised you'd even they let like, you get away with something like that at the time? Or was it with which scene? The no, people were much less uptight in those days than they are now. Uh, but it, it was, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, we were saying and doing anything, and it was, uh, I think these days, you'd have all the damn Christians down your throat. You know, you couldn't do that scene of these days. It, what's that organization that would have you banned from being on the air, much as they banned Saving Private Ryan for being, using obscene language? We couldn't get away with it. I thought it was really fun when I finally saw it, and I thought Keir, I remember thinking, oh, Keir DeLay is really good. <laughs> He's really scary. Um, uh, Toronto in the, those days was just starting to 
blossom as a city that had jazz and blues and uh, things were starting to percolate in Toronto. So there was a whole atmosphere around the movie, which was, um, hey, we made this up. You know, this is homegrown Canadian stuff, and look, isn't this fun? And it worked, and and uh, we were not concerned in those days with box office. And young filmmakers now run and check their box office receipts, and maybe Bob did, but none of us ever gave a damn about that sort of thing. That was beside the point. But the film itself worked, and and was scary and and funny, uh, and so it was that wonderful mix of horror and humor, which you kind of can't beat. Um, which I'd been introduced to by Brian De Palma, so I got why if you were doing horror, you had to be funny, or else it was just deadly. Yeah. How did you compare working on something like Black Christmas with working on something like Sisters? I remember um, Brian De Palma was much more driven, or seemingly so, than Bob Clark. And so it was a more intense experience, because, but then I was sleeping with the director, so you know, it's kind of different. <laughs> I was going home with him every night. Um, yeah. Uh, we sort of talked about it already, but I'm in the sense that this film you didn't think it would last at all or right. become a cult kind of movie. When did you get the sense that people were still picking up on the film? Well, it was one of those things that crept up on you gradually. You'd made this obscure Canadian horror movie and didn't think anything of it and moved on to the next thing. And then five or ten years later, some guy will stop you on the street and go, God, I left you in Black Christmas. And you'll think, oh, that's interesting. And then if it happens enough times, um, y y you get the point. A lot of people watched it and loved it and kept their memorabilia. And there's, I still have tons of people coming up and asking for autographs for Black Christmas stuff. It just, it's amazing to me. This was a long time ago. This was, what, almost 30 years ago we made this? Yeah, I'm old, honey. So it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of fascinating uh, the way it turns out that something that you didn't put the same weight to as you might have other things turns out to have this kind of extraordinary longevity. And look at the cast. Look at all the people in the cast who went on to do well. Kind of fun. Well, that was a whole different yeah. thing. That was that like was it. called being in a global hit. That's a whole different experience. That's bizarre and weird. But, but now it sort of became, has become a kind of cult movie in a way. What? Superman. Well, it's a classic. I wouldn't call it a cult movie. It's too expensive. <laughs> you know, it was a it wasn't an underground thing at all. That 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 was a whole different experience. Okay. Okay. Um, I remember being picked up every morning, and Olivia would already be in the car, and I usually was disheveled and often slightly hungover, um, whether it be pot or booze, it didn't matter, one or the other. And Olivia was very straight to me in those days, and but she was determined that she was going to marry Paul McCartney, and that was the the height of Beatles stuff. So. Or they just they'd broken up, but she, I, and I thought she knew Paul McCartney, but she didn't. But she decided she was going to marry him. So she was in one world of waiting for Paul to call, <laughs> and I thought she was very English and very lovely. She was just as exquisite uh, in person as she was in the movies, and so there were. But but we had very little in common, Olivia and I, and I was sort of mesmerized by her. And we'd drive to the set, and then Andrea and I'd hook up and. Stay Crack jokes. Set. Stay on the yeah. set overnight? Yeah. No. Yeah, some, 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 some actor did. The crew did. Uh, do you remember at all the scene where you're uh, in the police station you're drinking for a big can of beer? Yeah, yeah. the fellatio scene. Yeah. Where I spell out fellatio, that scene? Yes, I remember that, and I remember us all laughing hysterically when we filmed it, thinking we were... Um, being outrageous. Was I drinking beer? Is that the question? I don't think so. I think even in those days we knew that you didn't get drunk on the set. I remember Bob was very specific about what we were, as long as we got his dialogue in, if you added something that worked and that was, um, that added some kind of zip or character, he was fine with it. Otherwise, he just pulled you right back, you know. Uh, 
I do know that my character was already written as quite wild and outrageous because that's why I took the part. That's why I thought it was fun. Afterwards, did you, uh, did you come back to Canada to make many more films? Yeah. I, um, it wasn't a nationalistic thing. It was, where's the best job? There was no, I didn't personally, even though I know a lot of Canadian filmmakers did, I didn't have any sense of being part of the Canadian film industry. I just wanted to get ahead and get rich and famous and, uh, and be a movie star. I didn't even get that I wanted to be an actress at that point, although I did love acting. Um, so on a personal level, it was a matter of what was the best part. And what happened was that I got to for some reason do uh, slightly more eccentric characters in Canadian movies than I did in American ones. So I, I accepted a lot of work in Canada. I think that's because the commercial considerations were not as great as they were here in L.A. Did you have a sense that the industry was growing at that time? The yes, it was pretty exciting. Um, but the industry down here was as well. There was such a, a counterculture boom in the late 60s, early 70s, that separating it into nations uh, seemed beside the point to many people. Uh, things were exploding all over and possibilities were limitless. So that applied to Canadian filmmakers as well as down here. Now I know that for people who stayed in Toronto and Montreal, and I guess Vancouver, although it wasn't into that orbit yet, there was a great sense of, of, of creating an industry in Canada. But I wasn't really part of that. I was someone who got hired because I'd left. I think had I stayed there, I probably wouldn't have worked. You know, there was something exotic about someone who'd gone to LA and kind of made it. Because I'd been in two big, three big American movies. Did you work in any of the horror films after Black Christmas? I've done a ton of horror films. <laughs> Amityville Horror, Reincarnation of Peter Proud. Uh, oh God, I think there's a lot of them. Yeah, I was kind of a scream queen there without knowing it. How would you say the Black Christmas fits into those? Is it one of your favorites? Or? Yeah, Black Christmas had the intelligence to have a, have a twinkle about itself, to have a good sense of humor about itself. Um, so it wasn't quite as earnest. <laughs> and Bob was very clever and smart and a good businessman and, and, and great fun. He had, was absolutely lacking in pomposity of any kind. Do you have a sense that the film has, in a way, influenced other horror films? Like you know, I'm the wrong person to talk to. I don't, I'm not a horror film buff. I don't get it. They make me laugh. I remember going, in fact, it was while we were shooting Black Christmas, and uh, The Exorcist came out. And it was an Easter Sunday, and I was in Toronto. I'm pretty sure it was Black Christmas. I'm almost positive. And, and in fact, I think it was Bob who said, go see this one. And then I went to see it, and I saw it, for some reason, with a predominantly black audience. I don't know what part of Toronto it was. And everyone started to laugh. And once she came downstairs and peed on the carpet, everyone started laughing like crazy, and we just didn't stop till the movie was over. I think that was in Toronto or in New York. I can't, what a blur it all is. <laughs> But so there, there was, I did know and I knew from Brian that there was this very respectable, serious underground group of people who just worshipped horror movies. I mean, remember, I lived with De Palma for two years and whenever he was depressed, he went to four horror movies in a row. But I always thought it was very odd. I'd be reading D.H. Lawrence in my room, dreaming of marrying Lord Byron or something, you know, even though he was dead. Um, but there, I did know there were all these people who loved horror movies. I was just never one of them, and I'm still not, so I never quite get it. I'm, I'm kind of thrilled that this is a cult classic, but I don't know why. Is that just totally useless? I guess that's the wrong thing to say, but I don't know what else to answer. Well phrased, I think. <laughs> Do you have any favorite scenes from the film at all? No, because it was 30 years ago, I and I haven't seen it yet. I barely remember it. Yeah. I just remember having a lot of fun. Yeah. We really had a lot of fun and laughed and laughed and laughed. And um, that's mostly what I remember. Do you remember the, the turtle scene? Oh. 
Yes, what happened? What was the turtle scene? What happened with the turtle? Um, it was, uh, I think you're on, you're sitting on the couch. Something about turtles humping. Yeah. Yeah. Going to the zoo and watching zebras. That's right, yes. No, Bob wrote all that. There was a little, few little colors I threw in, but Bob wrote the whole turtles humping scene. That's right. <laughs> Doing homework was fun for this character. How so? Well, because you, you your boundaries are are wider than they are when you're playing a character like that than they are when you're playing the female lead, where you're limited to having to be attractive all the time, which is really dull. Um, so when you did your homework, I remember when I did my homework back in the hotel on this one, and I can almost see the hotel room. The idea was how far can I push this rather than whoops, that's not very safe. And Bob encouraged that. Was it fun playing a college student? Well, I wasn't much older than a college student myself, so yeah, it was fun. Yeah. That's good. Is there any stories that we missed? I wasn't until I woke up this morning and I was thinking about you guys and I went, shit, I don't remember a lot. I was trying to, th I mean, I remember going to see B.B. King for the first time at the Commodore. Is it the Commodore? No, not the Commodore. That's Vancouver. Vancouver. There's a, the Brunswick. What? Yeah. yeah. And stuff like that. But I, n not from the set. <laughs> yeah. Remember any reviews in the film? Anybody commented about your, your acting in the film? No, because when you make a movie, it doesn't come out generally till a year later, and you've moved on to other things, so it wasn't relevant to me. I didn't think it would ever see the light of day. It was a movie I didn't think anybody would see. I just didn't, you know, I, pu I put the right amount of effort into it, but um, I didn't take it very seriously in terms of what the product was going to be and what it was going to end up as, so it was just a delightful surprise that it became this cult classic. And I don't think when it first came out it was a huge hit at all. Yeah. It just never went away, <laughs> which is fun. <laughs>